Oh. I'm Charles Haynes, and uh, we're sharing experiences with Meher Baba. I want to tell you how Happy Club started. That's the easiest thing to talk about. Happy Club is a group of about 60 children in Myrtle Beach who come to Meher Center every week to play and uh, to enjoy the presence of Baba at his center. And it has been through these children that we've been able to reach many families in Myrtle Beach and to uh, work with uh, those in need in our area. Now, how it all came about goes back first to 1965. My sister Wendy went home one day with Bessie Graham, who worked for Elizabeth Patterson, and saw uh, Bessie's grandchildren playing in the streets. And Wendy said, well, we have uh, so, you know, so much uh, land and everything, why can't they come and play with me? And so uh, Wendy invited them to come to the center. And that was in 65, uh, and that was the first happy club with her grandchildren. The oldest grandchild came first. Well, it was from this little beginning, and they told their friends, and their friends told their friends, and it sort of multiplied. And from this small beginning, Happy Club grew to uh, the huge size it is today, and daycare, and health clinic, all the other things that black and white together have done in Myrtle Beach through Baba's love and grace. But the real story goes back to when Meher Baba was in Myrtle Beach in 1958, and we didn't know this until very recently. We were watching a film of Meher Baba in Myrtle Beach in 1958, and we saw that uh, Baba uh, was having the children's party. Now, I remember the children's party, and Wendy remembers it, as being that special day just for children. It was a birthday party for everyone. And uh, Mayor Baba uh, said that if on that day he would see anyone who came as long as they had children. That was the condition. And that was the only day in his visit to the center in 1958 that Meher Baba saw anyone that could be called public or new. So there he was, uh, and he had opened the gates of the center, and those in the town who had children brought their children, and that was how they got to be with, with Baba. Well, the tables were set up, long tables, and all the children would just sit there, and then there was a seven-layer cake, uh, I guess to represent the seven planes of consciousness, with all these candles on it, it was like a burning bush, and uh, Kitty, uh, Baba had Kitty blow out the candles, and Baba cut the cake himself, uh, and then he gave out lemonade with his own hands as prasad to all the children who were lined up in front of Baba, sitting at this table. And Baba was at, at the head of the table under a big tree, uh, and those of you who've been to the Meher Spiritual Center, it's near the swing. Uh, right there in the center, and the cake was under what is called the shelter area. But when we reviewed re this whole event on the film, uh, we discovered that Bessie Graham came up to Baba at one point with her grandchild in her arms, and she leaned over, and Baba reaches up in the film and kisses this little child. And just as that moment, my, at that moment, my sister's coming into the picture and leaning over with a big smile and looking right there at Baba and the child as it's happening. So you have the three of them in, in, the, in, a, in a pose together as Baba's kissing the child and Wendy's face is right there next to them. Uh, and as we saw that, we realized that it was not only was that the first happy clubber seven years later, 1965, that was the first Happy Clubber. Not only was Wendy the instrument to bring the first Happy Clubber to the center, but it was on the same spot where they first played on the first day of Happy Club, seven years later. 
And we realize in that moment uh, another example of how Baba plans everything down to the smallest detail, leaving out nothing. And we may feel and see simply what he's done in Myrtle Beach, a revolution of love there that has changed the social order in Myrtle Beach. Now we may just be able to see that, but how do we know that as he is God-man, that he has not worked on black people and white people, poor people, everywhere through these few children? It's very possible and most likely knowing Baba. Not only that, Baba over the years had pictures of Happy Club sent to him, and he touched each child individually and blessed each one and called it his Happy Club. And he sent to the children uh, the little children's book, May Her Baba is Love, and he signed it for them. And this was when Baba was in deepest seclusion, too. So that we feel that in some way these children have played a very significant part in the black revolution, in the needs of the poor, and all of the things that everyone is struggling with. It has been Meher Baba, in his own way, has planted the seeds of the solution, which is love, from that very moment when he kissed that child. To today, love has been the key to all of our problems in Myrtle Beach and, and I'm sure everywhere else too. Uh, I would like to say before we, we leave the center in 58 that Elizabeth Patterson was my link to Meher Baba. And uh, our family first heard of him through her. She has been with Meher Baba since 1931 is one of his greatest disciples. Uh, and I mention this because it has been her example, along with Kitty Davy, who is also at the center, has been their example that has enabled me to draw closer to Baba, to be able to do anything at all for Meher Baba in his work. They founded the center, or Elizabeth and Norina Machiavelli founded the center, and then Baba brought Kitty to the center in 1952 to uh, help to keep it for him. And it is, it is through these two individuals that I have seen what true discipleship is. My mother tells the story that on the, the last day that Meher Baba was there in 1958, we called everyone in very early. Of course, this didn't include the children, but he called many of the people who were there in very early, and he had Elizabeth on one side and Kitty on the other. And Baba had called them all together for the sole purpose of showing them what true discipleship really is. What constant remembrance of him in every little thing. Because as Baba does, they do, in the sense that they would put in everything they do the highest effort. And they never think of any detail as too small. And when Meher Baba was there in 1958, everything was kept so beautifully, so perfectly arranged for him. Every comfort, every detail was thought of. And ever since then, the center has been kept as though he were there physically every moment. Or he could come in the gate and everything would be ready. His home, all the places where he visited and stayed in that whole area. So I want to mention that before we leave the center and uh, to say what Mayor Baba once cabled on Elizabeth's birthday. Uh, he said to uh, her, the love that you have put in to the making of my center comes from my heart where you are very close, Mayor Baba. So that is in that atmosphere that our family first touched him, first had a glimpse of him. And I think that he showed us as much as we could take at the time. 
He gave us He gave us what we could absorb and no more. And then he left, saying as he left that I never leave here. I will always be here. We didn't see him again until 1962 during the uh, East-West Gathering. This was a gathering that Mayor Baba had planned for many years. And uh, it had not come about. Baba kept postponing it and postponing it. In fact, it was to have come about finally in 1957. And if it had, then we would never have met Baba because we would not have been able to go to India. We didn't hardly know of him then. But instead he changed his mind. He came to this country in 58. So by 62, uh, uh, everyone was anticipating this event that he predicted for many years when all of his Eastern and Western lovers would come together. And Baba issued the call, and of course, everyone who could went. Uh, Baba was very practical, did not wish people to endanger their jobs or their families, but those who could went. And it was... Uh, an indescribable event. Uh, I I can't give it uh, justice, but uh, I can remember from you know the angle of vision where I stood something of what it was like. At that time, I was thirteen, and uh, again, being young, I had certain advantages, and I saw things from. Uh, a certain standpoint that uh, others perhaps couldn't see. Uh, at that time, Mayor Baba's suffering was tremendous. The Cuban Missile Crisis was with us. In fact, uh, the Cuban Missile Crisis had just been resolved as we were leaving India. It was just in the process of being resolved as we were going to India. And the Chinese at that time were invading India. So the world situation was very tense and close to being complete world war, and everyone felt it. In this country, people were praying in schools, I remember, just before we left for India. And Mayor Baba's help reflected the world conditions. When we arrived in India, uh, I remember during the time, Mayor Baba referred to this, and uh, went like this, as if to say, and like this is if to say how close, when someone asked him about the world situation. Uh, but nevertheless, Baba was radiant and uh, loving. He never showed that side, except that we knew and could feel, and he would say that his suffering was tremendous. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, me. Well, the first day we came in to be with Baba, Baba called men and women separately at first from the West. Uh, and the program was that the Westerners were to be with Baba in the mornings and Easterners in the afternoon. And before all this began, and Easterners and Westerners with together in the afternoon, before all this began, Baba uh, saw us privately as men and then as women. Uh, the women got to go first, uh, and we heard all these glowing reports of how beautiful Baba was and uh, all these things. And we were actually, it was a surprise and uh, that we were even called. We thought that, well, maybe the men won't be called. And then Baba said, of course, we could come too, and gave us a long time with him. This uh, sofa reminds me of the one Baba was sitting on, Gurupasan. It was very similar. Baba sat on a sofa in a long, a big, empty room, uh, and all of us sat on the floor in front of him. But on that first day, we were allowed to embrace Baba to greet him. And uh, so we all came in, end up, for our embrace, in front of Baba. And I, of course, was small, being 13, and, and in my place in the line, I seemed to always be in lines in these stores, and I was trying to get a glimpse of Baba, and uh, to I, I really had this feeling, strong feeling. Well, I just can't believe that I'm actually here and seeing Baba again. 
because we hadn't seen Baba since 1958. So I was trying to get a glimpse of him just to reassure my mind that yes, he was actually there and he was actually seeing us. You see. So, uh, but I couldn't. I couldn't see around all these big people. And uh, one time I looked around and I saw this hand flash out just for a split second. This beautiful hand, and it was and it was unmistakably Baba's. Uh, he was gesturing, and uh, if you've ever seen close-ups of Baba's hands, they were the most beautiful part of Baba, and of course he spoke with his hands too, and they remained young, even even though Baba uh, was, uh, what, 66, is that right, 66 in 1962, 68, 68 in 1962, so that, that's right, so that he... Uh, Although an older man, his hands were very young, very beautiful. And speaking with his hands, uh, the gestures, the grace, I mean, no one uses their hands like Baba did. And so when I saw that hand flash out, I knew that we were with him. And as we came up to be with him, Erich, uh, before it was my turn, you know, Erich greeted me, standing near Baba, and I could, I didn't even wasn't even able to see him. I couldn't even picture him now because my whole being was riveted on the fact that I was going to uh, embrace Baba in the next moment. You know, and then it came my turn, and uh, I was just tremendous. Uh, I mean, I didn't know what to do exactly. You know, I mean, I didn't know. I hadn't seen Baba since I was eight years old, but in the interim, I'd grown to love him so much. You know, and just. Oh, you know, everything now is Baba, and uh, there he was, right there, you know. So I reached out, and Baba, first of all, Baba gestured like this, and how I'd grown. And then Baba reached out like this, and I reached out, and I embraced Baba, and I grabbed his shoulders, like, just to make sure it was really him. It was so hard to believe, you know. So I grabbed, just so I could feel. And when Baba embraced, it always seemed to me very ephemeral, as though uh, sometimes it's like air, you know, I mean, you could hardly remember it. It was so uh, light. Uh, so that when I'd embrace him this time, I was determined that I was going to remember this embrace, you see. So I grabbed him by his shoulders. And then Baba embraced me, and I rubbed him on each cheek, just to make sure, you know, that it was really you know, one cheek and then on the other side like that. And just, uh, and he was just beaming. Oh, he just, just lit up, you know, he was so happy. And then we sat near him, and he joked with all the men, you see, and, and he asked how each one was. And, uh, John Bass, how are you? And, uh, and Harry Kenmore, same as always. And uh, each one, you see, he knew personally, and Baba would comment on them. And, their health, and uh, Ben Heyman, who had trouble keeping awake, he was very elderly at the time, and Bob would, you wake Ben? You wake? And, and, and he'd always have someone punching poor Ben to keep him awake. Uh, so that everyone had this personal relationship with Baba, and I'm sure that everyone in the room felt that Baba was speaking directly to them, and that everyone, that everything he said was said just to them, you know, because he had that way. The room could be completely filled Baba oh, had a way of just making each one, you know, reaching each one like that. And I always tried to get as close as possible, and being small, I was able to do that without irritating too many people. Uh, it always struck me, too, that uh, people, very nice people ordinarily, you see, who... It always struck me that people around Baba would always... Um, who were ordinarily very polite people, I mean, uh, would become uh, very different when trying to be near to Baba. It was every man for himself, and often people would um, try everything they could to get that extra moment with Baba, to be as close as they could. Uh, and I, I would, uh, I remember, you know, how Baba used to reach out and he would touch so often. So, of course, the closer you were, the more likely that you might get one of those touches or those glances. And if you were way in the back, you know, uh, and Baba 
uh, was glancing around, you might miss. So everyone tried to get as close as they could. And the first day that the men were with Baba, as I say, Baba greeted us all personally, made us feel right at home immediately. Uh, and he gave the impression that this gathering would not be one with a lot of discourses or explanations. He didn't want any questions, you know, he didn't want any problems. He just wanted it to be a personal, silent, and deep relationship with him. Something more was going on, uh, naturally being the East-West gathering, bringing the East and West together, and being, bringing Hindus and Muslims and black and white and Christian and Jew all together under one tent, uh, we knew that there was something else going on. But as far as we were concerned, we were with him, with our beloved. And we tried to take advantage of every moment of that. And that is a very difficult thing. I remember from the very first day we were with Meher Baba sitting there, uh, I thought to myself, well, how, how can I possibly get as much out of this as I should? I knew it was a rare thing. I knew perhaps that we would never see him again in form. I knew that we were only going to be there five days. So, uh, with all that in mind, I would stare at Baba almost continuously, trying to drink him in as much as possible. But it was impossible. You just, you could only take so much. And Baba would only show as much as you could take. And he knew that limit. But fortunately, I didn't have to listen to all the talk, you know. I didn't have to be aware of what people were doing as much. And I didn't know most of the people. And when Baba did have Francis explain the four journeys, I couldn't understand anyway. And that was in the morning, too. And the morning sessions were very informal and relaxed. And Baba would be with all the Westerners. Uh, and one particular morning, when Francis had the big chart out, and he would point to all the things on the chart, he would explain what the four journeys back to God were and all of these things. Uh, everyone was busily following along, trying to figure out exactly what all this was. And at the end of it all, Baba looked around and uh, looking very serious, because only Baba can look. Around. Well, did, did you understand? Did you understand? Everybody sort of hung their head sheepishly, you know, because <laughs> no one had understood. Well, and someone said, well, I think so, Baba. Baba said, yes, do you understand? Well, most of it, Baba. I, I mean, I think I got most of the points. Do you, do you understand? Yes, Baba, I, I think so. I, I, I listened, Baba. Well, then Baba said, don't worry. It's all zero. <laughs> it's all zero, love. But I want you to understand it. <laughs> so that during the time, Baba, once he did give an explanation himself, and he called for uh, a number of props, and he had these seven cups, metal drinking cups of different colors. And Baba would put one cup inside the other one, and then another one, you see, to describe whatever it was he was describing. And was beyond me, I can assure you, I don't have no idea what it was. And he kept doing this, you see, and then he put another cup in on top, and everyone was watching carefully as I would put this cup and then that cup and trying to remember what color was what, you know. And then finally Baba said, oh, held up the cup and he said, you just wanted to see Baba play with the cups. And then he began in earnest to play with them, you see, to put them in really fast and to see how fast he could put them in. And freed us up and made us feel as though Baba uh, didn't put any importance on the fact that we were, you know, his broken down furniture, we were his western hard nuts to crack. So Baba treated us personally as children, as his children, and he didn't mind uh, what we brought to him. He accepted it. And he accepts, and I think he does today, in the same way. He accepts whatever people have to offer, and uh, in whatever way. Because Baba loves us as we are, and wants us to become more as we are. So in those early 
morning gatherings with Bala. Uh, it would be informal. It would be just the Westerners. And then in the afternoons, it would be East and West together. And those afternoons, Bala had the Westerners witness uh, his, his darshan, his giving of love. And I think that that was one of the most important parts of the East-West gathering, was that witnessing of divine love in action. There he was, I mean, he was obviously not well and suffering. And yet, in those five days, he embraced thousands of people. Who knows, I think perhaps 20,000. Individually. And with each one, he gave out love. But not just simple human love. But he touched the heart, and each person went away feeling special, as though they had received something tremendous within themselves. And many of these people came from very long distances, tremendous hardship, some on foot even, in trains, bullet carts. You know, to have this one moment with Bob, and this was when he touched their heart. And then sometimes he would stop them as they came by, and he would uh, ask them about the work they were doing for him, or how they were, how they had been, how their families were. And then Baba uh, would sometimes turn to Erich and, or someone nearby and say, Oh, how much that person loves me, touches him. So that we saw divine love in action. If we hadn't believed that Baba had so much love before, we did then, because he demonstrated for our very eyes. And I think for all time, too. We have no idea of the significance of what was really going on then in the East-West gathering. We have no idea what it meant to really bring together all of these different kinds of people from the East and the West, all the different religions, races, creeds, under one tent, and bring them together in harmony and love, in complete harmony and love. We have no idea what that really means for the future of the world. But for us, at that moment, it was to be with our beloved Baba. And uh, I think that it's remarkable, too, how Baba made an individual feel as though uh, he was completely there for him or her. And it was, there was no thought for home, there's no thought for school or family or friends. I don't remember where my family was during the whole time of the East-West gathering, where my brother and sister were, or my mother. I only know that I was there with Baba. And yet, at the same time, Baba made us experience a oneness that we'd never experienced before. Not a oneness in personalities, or in beliefs, and ideas, but a deeper oneness. A oneness in inexpressible love. Yeah. There was only one thing that I asked Baba during that time, and I think it's the only thing I've ever asked Baba, uh, and that was to go early in the morning to be with him, to try and get there before everyone else, really, so that I could get a good seat. And uh, it was really quite an experience to actually ask Baba something to go up to him and to say uh, anything, because our relationship wasn't like that. Uh, our relationship was one in silence, and it was one where we just naturally felt each other. He would tease me and touch me, he would reach out to me, but he, he and I had nothing to say to each other. I had no questions for Baba, he had no questions for me, and we would just be together. I mean, it was just, oh, when I was alone, you know, when I wasn't in his physical presence, I would talk to him. But it would be an inner talking, and he would answer inner, in an inner way, so that uh, actually the thought of going up to him in human form and asking him something 
was tremendous. It was overwhelming. It may seem like a simple question. May I walk early in the morning? You know, but may I go before the buses go? But to me, it was, it was a, something outside of my relationship with Baba. It was always superfluous to use words with him for me. And I never had any words. And really still don't have any when it comes to him. But I had to. It's one of those things. I wanted to go early. So I went up on the platform and I told Erich my problem, what I had to ask Baba. And Erich uh, said, all right, let's go, ask Baba. And there we were, right, in front of seven or eight thousand people seated in front of us, people waiting to embrace Baba, musicians waiting to play for Baba, and uh, somehow or another I got the courage up to ask Baba if I could walk early in the morning. Don't know how, but as I say, Baba always made you feel that he was there just for you, and somehow I was able to do it. And Erich asked him quickly in Gujarati, and uh, Baba stopped and pondered for a moment, and looked over at me like that. Erich said, Baba says, he's very happy. It's fine, you can walk early in the morning. <laughs> and uh, then I got off the stage as quickly as possible. And the next morning, uh, a few of us walked early. I remember that we arrived at Guru Prasad on the porch, and uh, some of the mandali greeted us. And several mornings, we walked early. Different things would happen. This particular morning that I'm thinking of, and believe me, chronology has no place when you're with Meher Bab. Time has no place. Place has no place. You're just with Baba, right? I don't remember exactly what came before what. It all was just one timeless moment. It just can't be separated. But I know that this particular morning that I'm thinking of, Rano came out and said to us, I go and surprise Baba. And there Baba was. He had gotten up early, it must four or five, to greet the last of his lovers that had not been able to have his embrace the day before. And there was this line, still a long line, and Baba still embracing each one, still giving out that love. Because even Baba had a human form, and he could get tired, and he suffered tremendously. No one understands how much Baba said that he suffered. But he did suffer. Uh, but there he was, you know rising to the occasion and giving each one. Well, Baba couldn't and didn't let down and still doesn't any of his lovers. See, there they were. And there was one particular fellow who would come and get his embrace, then go back, get in line again, get another embrace, and do it again and again. And Baba expe expressed a great pleasure, you see, every time he'd come up. He'd say, oh, if you were again, I would give him another embrace. Because Baba knew where his heart was, you know. So we came out, and believe me, to surprise Baba, and to begin with, I never thought it was possible. Coming outside, and there Baba was, we saw the back of him, his hair t tied behind him, and Rana said to go ahead and to, to kiss him on the back of the head and to surprise him, you see. Boy, I tell you, it took a lot of courage, and I finally went out and I kissed Baba right on the back of his head. and. I, I can still feel and remember that warmth of his head and that perspiration that he was drenched in from all that he'd been doing and that tremendous effort that you could feel in, in him. She just touched him, you know. Not for himself, but for all of these thousands of people. And then Baba looked up and smiled and gestured to see his, his pleasure and told us to sit next to him. and. There he was, Baba, you know, it was so early in the morning, and all of these people for days had been embracing him, but he was still Baba. Baba never changed, he's always Baba. He's radiant, beaming, in spite of all. And so we sat and we witnessed once again that love, coming again, again, just a limitless love.
No one has ever, the world probably has never seen, nor will ever see, love like that. And I'm sure that with each person Bob embraced then, he's made possible all the love that there is now in the world for him and for God. Another morning when we came early, uh, Mani greeted us and somehow spirited away the rest of us. We were a dwindling group. Every time we walked, a few just couldn't make it. It was quite a walk. And, uh, and, and, the younger, and the younger children just couldn't make it, you see. So we would sort of dwindle down. And this particular morning, it was a small group, and the women mindly spirited off the girls, and I think I was the only boy. So uh, Monty mumbled something. She said, I'll get you some bananas for breakfast, you see. And she went away. And uh, someone came out and said, uh, and meanwhile, by the way, I was peeking in to see Baba through the doors, the glass doors, you see. And I saw Baba sitting there in the sofa, uh, in the middle, somewhat like this sofa. And uh, Ruth Ringer was massaging his feet. Something I think she'd always longed to do it was her heart's desire. And Baba had allowed her that privilege. And then she left the room, and there Baba was, all alone, sitting in that room. And I didn't look too long, because I, I didn't know if I was supposed to. And I backed away, and then some Mondali member said, Baba says, you may go in and see him, and greet him. I just, my heart almost stopped, you know, the very thought of going in that room. But I took my shoes off. When I opened the door, and there he was, he said, at the end of the room, all alone, completely alone. And uh, th this was a rare thing, because, as you know, Baba always had a watchman, even at night. And even when he was in seclusion, he would have someone nearby. And of course, when he had darshan, there'd always be the interpreter. Even when you would have a private interview with Baba, there would be someone there to interpret what Baba was saying. But there was no one this morning. He was absolutely alone. And, uh, and I know from reading about Baba's life how rare that moment is when he is alone. And he was just sitting there. And I entered the door, and there Baba was at the other end of the room, sitting on the sofa. And it was a long room. And it was very long that morning. And Baba seemed so far away, all the way at the other end. And I knew I had to get from that spot to Baba to cross that floor. So I began the journey. And it was the longest journey of my entire life. And every step was tremendous effort. My legs just were about to collapse like rubber. In a private interview, with Baba, you'd always have an interpreter, someone to say uh, what Baba was gesturing. So that this moment with Baba was very, very rare. He was absolutely alone. And I know from reading something of Baba's life how rare it is that he's completely alone. And I had to then get from the door to Baba. And it seemed like an interminable journey. The room seemed endless, a long way away. And Baba was there sitting at the other end of the room, watching me. Never took his eyes off me the whole time, he was just watching me. And I was at this end, watching him. And my legs were just about ready to collapse. There was no one at all. All the doors were closed all around us. Just this big empty room, Baba on the sofa. And it was the aloneness that was the amazing thing. I don't know if that makes sense, but the fact that Meher Baba was there alone, in himself, complete, was what made it so beautiful. No adornments, no people, no mandali, no lovers, just him sitting alone in himself. And as I came closer and closer to Baba, it got more and more difficult. Every step became an effort, until finally I arrived at his feet, and I embraced Baba. And uh, Baba gestured 
like that. And then we stood there. I stood looking at Baba. He sat looking at me. And uh, he appeared so helpless in a way. And he couldn't say anything because I couldn't understand his gestures. And I couldn't say anything to him. So there we were trying to uh, communicate and we couldn't. I mean, it was that moment of helplessness. And in that moment of looking at Baba, and just looking into his eyes and looking at me, um, I realized in a way that I can't express that he, he was, is, and always has been God. He, how could he be anything else? He was so beautiful, so pure, so simple, and his eyes just held all of that without any, anything, any support, any adornment, just the simple figure, his simple human form held all that. And you knew that this man sitting there was one with everything. Just it was inescapable. And in that moment we exchanged that. And I knew that Baba was giving me that. And then I knew inwardly when the moment was right for me to leave. And somehow or another I got out back onto the porch. To this day I can't tell you how I got out whether I backed out, crawled, walked, or ran. But somehow, I left Baba's presence with the, the stamp on my mind and heart that Baba, as Baba, in himself, is everything and more that we could ever imagine or want him or expect him to be. So many things happened. Uh, during those few days at the East-West Gathering. Endless variety, and it would seem uh, it's a lifetime of experience. During that period of the East-West Gathering, every time I saw Baba, he would gesture to me like this. Now, it was a curious thing, and the only time I've witnessed it with him. But every time he gestured to me this way, there was no interpretation. Erich didn't say a word. But he would deliberately sometimes look at me and very emphatically go like this. And once I remember, Mother and I were the last two in the room to leave. And Baba looked up at us both and he smiled. And uh, he looked at me, he looked at Mother, like that. And then Baba opened his arms for me to embrace him. And over and over again, he would say this to me, and he never explained what it was. And I never thought about it. It seemed so natural. In fact, in 1958, when we were with him, Every time almost that I would see Baba, I can remember him turning and saying emphatically. And it wasn't until 19, about 1967, I think, that it came clear what Baba was saying to me. Now, he was saying many things, because every gesture of his says everything. But for me, personally, this gesture had a particular meaning. Often, you know, Baba would say this, holding up as a goal to be perfect in his love. Or he would hold this up as approval, as he's happy with your love. But for me, I didn't really feel that these things, they were there, I'm sure, but these weren't the important things that Baba was saying. But I was taking a friend of mine to the center in 1967 and showing him around the first time. And he asked me, 
did Baba ever tell you something? Did he ever give you an order, a command? Did he ever tell you what to do in your life? And without thinking, uh, I said, yes. Baba said, just love me. Like that. And it just came to me in my mind. It was right outside the lagoon cabin. I'll never forget. It just came to me. It came out. And that's when I knew what Baba wanted for me. And I think it's the only water he's ever given anyone, really. It's enough for eternity to just love him. That's all. To just love him. So I think that's what he meant all those times. And in 58, you see, as an eight-year-old, he told me that. He said, this is what you should do. And then, in 62, he emphatically reminded me every time he saw me so that I would never forget. And every time I would, I would see him doing this to me. And then finally in 67, he gave me the grace to at least know the command. And now begins the journey of the obeying the order which may take lifetimes, but at least the order is given. And for anyone who loves Baba, when the order is given, in other words, when his love touches your heart, then from then on, it's the beautiful journey of carrying it out. Also in 62, uh, there were so many examples of how Baba would show his love to those around him we would be seated near him. And I always liked to, to get as close as possible. So when Baba would be seated on the sofa, I would try to get right here. And Baba's right. So I would, that's why I walked early and why I would run. And uh, I would be seated right here, as close as I could get, so that my head would rest on his knee during these long music programs Bob would have of Indian music. So it was a bit tiring for me at 13 and not understanding the music. I wanted to have a place near Baba where I could rest my head on him and then I could also have my face near him so that I could watch him and look at him. And he was much more fascinating than the music. You know, his face, his enjoyment of the music, always you know, like this with the music, and sometimes he'd tap out the music right next to me so that I could watch him. And I would watch his face, and sometime, one time, I looked probably for a particularly long time, and Baba looked over at me like that. He looked down, he smiled, and he grabbed me like that. Often, every morning, I would try and get there first to be in my place with Baba next to him, and uh, so that if I looked at him, he could reach out, he could touch me. Uh, I remember one time when the music had gone on for a particularly long time, I'd laid my head on Baba's lap and uh, I had begun almost to doze, you know, just to fog over a little bit and Baba quickly reached down and put his hand right over my face like that. And so that uh, when I opened my eyes I was looking looking right through Baba's hands. Woke up to look through, and there, there he was looking down, laughing at me. <laughs> and the Mandali never let me forget it, that I would <laughs> fallen asleep in Baba's lap. Wendy and I would always sit next to the sofa near Baba, trying to get as close as we could. Uh, and one particular day, I remember I had gotten close in my usual spot. And this is an example of Baba's love and, and compassion. Both Wendy and I remember the days that we were with Baba in that room with the Westerners as being next to him, right next to him. Both of us have the memory of being right touching him. Uh, and we both couldn't have been in the same spot, but yet it's just as vivid for each of us. And so who knows? The only film record we have of that was taken on the last day and Baba's brother Barum was allowed to come in and take the Westerners alone with Baba. And uh, that particular day I'd gotten in my usual place that somehow Wendy had wedged her way in between Baba and I. And so there we both were sitting in front of Baba 
and I was edging her out, and she was edging me out, and I was edging her out like this in front of Allah. I don't know how we ever got away with it. And finally, uh, we both sort of, well, I didn't give in. I put up a good fight, but we both sort of were sitting there next to Baba. And uh, that was the day, you see, that the cameras came in and recorded our moment with Baba. And Baba taught me such a, a lesson at, that it wasn't that important to begin with. And that he, what he had given me in those days with him, the many little things that he had done, can never be taken away. He can never be lessened or changed. Baba is Baba. So that whether I sat next to him, whether Wendy sat next to him, doesn't make any difference and that neither of us should worry. But both of us still remember the other four days as being in the same spot and no one will ever know what exactly happened. The last day, the last morning, we were with Meher Baba in the East-West Gathering was the most beautiful for me. The whole gathering had, as I say, reached a point of just credible love being released, credible oneness. And that last morning, Baba was with us and there was to be no gathering in the afternoon with the Easterners. So this was our last time with Baba. And Baba said to us, this may very well be the last time you will ever see me this way. And so that we were all, of course, our hearts were broken a bit to be leaving him. And Baba came in the room and sat down this time while we were there. Usually he was there first. And Eric said, Charles, Baba wants you to take off his sandals. And, uh, and I had my heart leap to my throat. You know. And I went and I lifted Baba's foot to take off his sandal. And it was so heavy. Baba didn't lift up his foot. He just let it go limp. And it was so heavy. And I felt the weight of his feet. And I thought of when John says that one will come whose sandals I am not fit to unlace, you know, in the Bible, I thought of that, and how unworthy I was to take this, to remove the sandals from the feet of the Beloved. But I did, and I put them next to Baba. And uh, then we were to each embrace Baba and to say goodbye. And one by one, we came up and embraced Baba. And Mani called me from behind the curtain, and I was weeping, of course. And she gave me a little gift from Baba. And I couldn't say anything to her or to anyone. I was just completely full of joy and sadness, of, of ecstasy and complete loss, of knowing we would have to leave in one way the presence of our beloved, perhaps forever, never to see the man form of Meher Baba again. And there's no doubt that, that man form is extremely beautiful, although it isn't Baba. And as many times as he told us during the gathering, this is not, this body that you see is not me, see me as I really am. Still, it was such a great experience that, and such a wonderful love that we had there. And we all were feeling at the same time this moment that we would have to leave, perhaps forever. And that was one of the last to embrace Baba, because I hung back, I just didn't want to. And finally, I embraced Baba, and everyone had finished, and uh, Baba sat there. And on this day, Baba appeared to me very small, like a child, little. Sometimes he could appear so huge and powerful, and other moments he could appear just like a child. And this particular day, he's appeared so small, and he looked around, and Baba gestured like this helplessly, and uh, said, Charles, Baba wants to know, where are his sandals?
And Baba couldn't leave because he couldn't find his sandals. And they'd been pushed under the sofa. We couldn't find them. So I scrambled on my hands and knees to find them so that he could leave. Baba put on his sandals. He got up. And he needed support to walk. He had two people supporting him on either side. But just before he got up, he looked out and he looked at my mother in front of him. And uh, he told her not to worry, not to be afraid. And he said, Open your eyes. Open your eyes. I am the Christ. Open your eyes and you will see me as I really am. And at that moment, as he got up to go, his little frail body was born 68 years of suffering and work. And as he leaned on heavily on two people to walk out of the room, looking like a little child, that moment I felt in my heart as never before, yes, Father, you are the Christ. You, you are the Christ. You know, that he was. And just the way he said it, I am the Christ. And then he walked out of the room. And and we knew that as that little white figure went out the room that that might be the last time. But Baba being Baba gave us one more glimpse. And a few days later as he was leaving to go home to Meherazad, he said that we could say goodbye to him under the tree. We couldn't embrace him. We could all come. So we all came to the tree in Bun Gardens and there Meher Baba sat and there was a tree that Babazan used to sit under too, and one where he often sat when he left uh, Puna to go back to Meherazad. And Baba, we just sat in silence with Baba for a while. And then Baba got up to leave. Then Baba got up to leave, and he got in the car. And there were many people there milling around the car to try and get a last glimpse of Baba. And this was actually the last time we ever saw Meher Baba in physical form, uh, driving away in, in the car. And I rushed forward and tried to get through the crowds to reach the car before it broke through. And I did, just on the edge of the crowd, just before it completely broke through to leave. And I got to the window of the back seat where Baba was sitting. And I went up to the window and I said, Goodbye, Baba. It was closed. The window was closed. But I said it and Baba looked up and he smiled. And the last thing he ever said, he gave two orders. And the first one was to be happy. He said, Be happy. And then Baba, you know, just love me. And then the car broke through. He was gone. And I think that those are the only two orders that count, that ever did count, or ever will count, with Baba, with any of his lovers. And I feel that Baba is still giving those same orders and is still making it possible to begin to obey them is still holding us to him, is still allowing us to participate in his work, in his love, and uh, is still very much with us, and always will be, as long as we hold on. In whatever name he takes, whatever form, those who love him will be there, will see him, will touch him, because of their great love. Baba told us in 1958, your love for me has brought me to the West. In 1962, Baba told us that it was because of love 
that this gathering had taken place. And when it comes down to it, it's Meher Baba's love for us that makes it po possible for us to love him. And if it were not for that love, we would have no life, nowhere to go, and nothing to do. But with that love, Baba has given the world a new life. As Meher Baba the man, as Meher Baba God in human form, and Meher Baba is the eternal beloved who is always with us. On February 1st, 1969, uh, I was at Emory University attending school. My mother had come from the center in Myrtle Beach to uh, direct a play at Emory. Uh, and I received a phone call very early in the morning, and it was Elizabeth from the center, who I call Auntie Boo. And uh, my first contact with Mayor Baba, my first link, and she said to me in a way that only she can say, uh, Charles, Baba says, God alone is real and there is nothing else. And then she said, it's unbelievable, but we've received a cable from Adi that uh, Baba has dropped his body. And uh, the moment I heard her voice on the phone, I knew that it was something momentous because she doesn't waste time or calls. It has to be something important. And I could tell in her voice that something important had happened. I, then she read the cable and told me to call Mother, who was staying nearby. The only thing I could say was, oh, and yes, and hang up. Uh, my first reaction was, of course, tremendous surprise and shock. I had fully expected to see Baba again in the human form. We had planned to go for the 69 Darshan. We expected to touch and embrace our beloved again. And when once every day, every moment, every hour is focused on that time when you will be with him again, uh, then it, of course, is a great shock when that's taken away. But as Elizabeth has always said, Mayor Baba never takes away anything without giving something much greater in its place. So I knew that something really unbelievable had happened, that something that had never happened before would happen in the world. And somehow or another, the event of Beloved Baba laying aside that form was momentous. I can't say how, but it just, it struck me as just so momentous and unbelievable that I contacted everyone. I know, and, and, and also another thing, I never thought I should go to India, I should this, I should that. I, d I felt that Beloved Baba had called us for darshan, in 69, and we would go to Darshan in April, we would obey him, he would be there, and he was. He was there more than he's ever been. So that in the thought of that day, in that moment when I heard that he was no longer in the human form, my thought was not India or Baba, body or anything. My thought was, we must let everyone know that has ever heard of him here. So my mother and I spent the day contacting everyone who knew of Baba, who had heard of him. And uh, we left notes, urgent notes, and we got everyone together and we told them. Uh, and I felt at that time that um, Baba's suffering had ended in the form. I felt that Baba was going to be with us more than ever. And I began to feel, as I looked around the little room where we met, 
at all those people who never touched him and, and saw him in the human form, I felt that Baba has, in his compassion, done something tremendous for these people. He will now touch them. He will now find them and touch them in a way that he couldn't and didn't when he had human form. And that all he did in that form led up to this time when he would be available to everyone. And I know it's difficult for people who did not touch Baba in the human form to think of it in those terms. But I'm not just saying it. Knowing Baba, as little as I do, I still think I can presume to say that he will give something much greater than he ever gave when he had that body. And that something greater is contained in the name Meher Baba alone, because he put all the love in his whole life work for in that name, and it will be that name that will change the world, will touch the hearts of millions. <laughs>